were used in the time period that we are discussing today. Frequently, the direct quotes that we have will use these very racist words, such as the uh, word Negro, and we hope that you, the listeners, understand that any usage of these words this hour are merely in the historical context, and that until the 1950s in America, this was the word or group of words that were used by many black Americans to define themselves as well. So that's just to say that we do in no way endorse these words or their usage, but that for the sake of historical yes. context, when direct quotes feature them, uh, we will use them. They are products of a different era, and uh, we're using them merely in this uh their role in historical relevance to what we're talking about today, which will be Reconstruction following the Civil War. Mm -hmm. A community announcement, too, real quick, is that Champaign-Urbana Food Not Bombs will be having weekly public meetings in Douglas Park on Saturdays at 6 p.m. Uh, these public picnics will have free food and free meals for anybody who wants to come and eat and join us for just an open public picnic. And if something changes due to the weather, it will be posted on their Facebook page, Food Not Bomb Champaign-Urbana, which I encourage you to check out. They will also have distribution of raw produce throughout town, more information about which is on their Facebook page. And Food Not Bombs holds that food is a right and not a privilege, and it seeks to eliminate, reduce food security, and food insecurity, and food waste in the community. The act of sharing food is a protest against war and the most destructive act that our government and many governments around the world subject people to. It is hoped that building a movement around food sharing will help to combat this movement of our governments around war. Indeed. And today we'll be talking about a, another movement, uh, more movements, one should say, that resulted from a war, that is the American Civil War. Our topic today will be covering uh, Reconstruction, white supremacy, black resistance, and the high politics of it all following the American Civil War. So we start today in the summer of 1865 when the Reverend T.H. Robinson at the Harrisburg Methodist Church in Pennsylvania gave a sermon on the divine justice of God and how it had been active in the war for the Union. Some members of his delegation were so moved by the sermon that it, they copied it down and requested it to be published, which it then was in a pamphlet form. Giving a whole history of the war in the sermon, and it's a very lengthy sermon, it's, it's like 33 pages, and explaining how God had been there all along with the people, even though he seemed to be not there at all in some very dark times during the Civil War, for instance, when senator after senator and state after state left the Union, when the battle after terrible battle was being fought, and more, the Reverend's speech stands out as an example of Northern thoughts on the war and the task before the nation just after the conclusion of the war in April of 1865. The assassination of President Lincoln on April 15th of that same year, the Reverend T.H. Robinson, in this pamphlet called, quote, A Blow Aimed at Mankind, and that was, quote, aimed at the life of the republic, at America. It was hoped that the nation, suddenly deprived of its ruler, would, in its despair, reel and plunge and sink in hopeless anarchy, end quote. But, the Reverend continued, quote, The government is stronger than ever. The people are braver. Liberty is more hopeful and buoyant than ever, end quote. Rather than mourning endlessly over their lost ruler, the task, as the Reverend T.H. Robinson understood it, was to press on. Quote, For us, the loyal people of the land, there is a noble conquest, a conquest of light and love, generosity and forgiveness. As we seek to in imitate the high and patient temper of our late thoughtful and magnanimous chieftain, let it be ours to build up the waste places of a conquered and helpless people, to upheave all roots of bitterness, to sow upon the track of desolation the seeds of liberty and Christian love, to let the common people know that if they are disposed to come back into the old home with the early love, we will meet them a great way off. End quote. The Reverend wanted there to be, quote, one mind, one will, and one heart to build up a nationality where there shall be no north, no south, no east, no west, end quote. So the reverence hopes that the South would merge back with the North to make a state where there was no such thing as Southerners or Northerners, Easterners or even Westerners, no Pacifican, no Pacificans or Atlanticans. This was a similar vision to the aspirations of many of the men and women of American liberal civil society in the North at this time immediately following the Civil War. The principal concern in the reverend's speech and sermon was to reunify the nation. The main goal was something that most people in the North and many people in the defeated South understood even and wanted. There was to be no more war, no more separated and destroyed families, properties, and lives. Most people understood this and these ideas as reconstruction, this word, 
and they understood in 1865 the word reconstruction to mean simply the reconstruction of the Union and the economic revitalization of the South through investments of capital and programs from the North to help diversify its agriculture and to help the South catch up to the Northern industrializing economy. That's how most people in American civil society, I mean white civil society, in 1865 understood the word reconstruction. In New Orleans, about a month before the sermon of Reverend T.H. Robinson that was given and then printed on pamphlets out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the newly freed black residents of the city were celebrating the removal from office of Hugh Kennedy, a Democratic mayor and proponent of slavery. Through, though the city had been occupied by the Union since 1862, surrounding areas of the South would take longer to fall. In May of 1865, the former Copperhead rebel-supporting mayor, Hugh Kennedy, was deposed and replaced with a Colonel S.M. Quincy by the military general who was then governing the state. Hugh Kennedy, the man that the black Republican newspaper was celebrating the removal of from office, he had been a copperhead and a supporter of slavery who supposedly wanted nothing more than to see the South rebuilt and return to its old ways of white supremacy. This was the type of reconstruction advocated for by white supremacists like Kennedy, a reconstruction of the South meaning it's only joining back with the Union with slavery, or white supremacy at least, intact. For removing the horrid Democrat Mayor Kennedy, the Black Republican, a newspaper edited and run by Black Republican progressives and radicals out of New Orleans, praised the administration of President Andrew Johnson, whom they affectionately called Andy Johnson. The Black Republican continued, saying, quote, We cannot help being thankful to God, who all through this revolution for our freedom has sent us deliverance at the right time. Defeated here, Governor Wells, the then Democrat governor of Louisiana, or Democrat sympathizer, I should say, I believe he was Republican, Governor Wells and Dr. Kennedy, with a few of their friends, have gone to Washington at the feet of the heroic President Johnson, who all his life has been fighting to overthrow just such men as now ask him to restore them to power. May they have a good time in learning from our noble president that the scepter has departed from their hands, because they hold it for evil, and henceforth there is for them only repentance and quiet submission to the true people whom the God of freedom has appointed to rule." End quote. The divine justice that Reverend T. H. Robinson would preach in his congregation to Pennsylvania was a very different kind of claim about how God was interacting in the lives of Americans than that being claimed by the authors of the editorial in The Black Republican. To the Reverend Robinson, the divinity had been in the way God had worked to restore the Union and help spur the North to victory. The great crime of the South had only been secession and their creation of the Confederacy. To the black radicals and progressives in New Orleans, meanwhile, and many black freedmen across the South, God's divine justice had been wrought through the end of slavery and the removal of power of rebels and slaveholders and the granting of that power through God to the, quote, true people whom the God of freedom has appointed to rule, end quote. Whereas Reconstruction in the North encompassed primarily ideas of Reconstruction of the Union, Reconstruction in the South held these ideas as well as ideas of new revolution of freedom hitherto unknown for black Americans. Ironically, the president that the black Republican authors had lauded in their article in May of 1865, Andrew Johnson, would within a few years be largely responsible for the destruction of their revolution of freedom. So, um... Getting on, we'll start with the high politics um, of basically Reconstruction right after the Civil War, Lincoln, Johnson, uh, radical Republicans, and so on. We'll go into some social aspects, the violence of it all, tie it back into politics at the end and its legacy today. So the historian David Blight of Yale University uh, sees Reconstruction as having taken two separate paths in its development. Um, the first one was one that sought quick Reconstruction with relative leniency on the rebels and done by presidential decree and authority. The other, championed by radical uh, progressive Republicans like Charles Sumner or Thaddeus Stevens, was a reconstruction that was to be long and thorough, that totally uh, implanted itself in every aspect of Southern society, um, with even trial and mass execution of Confederate le leaders to protect uh, and enforce black civil liberties, the newfound ones that were coming into age following the Confederate defeat, all under congressional authority. Uh, Abraham Lincoln himself preferred to be lenient on Confederate officials when it came to execution, but to continue using the army to protect freed slaves from white attacks. On the day of his assassination in a cabinet meeting, he expressed a will to forcefully expel Confederate leaders, saying, Frighten them out of the country, open the gates, let, them let down the bars, scare them off. End quote. 
many Confederates, as many as 10,000, did leave to places like Brazil, where slavery would still be legal for another 20 years, or England. Most, however, stayed stayed uh, in the South, often finding themselves back in positions of political or economic power, power in a few years' time. Uh, within a week following Confederate General Robert E. Lee's infamous surrender to the Union forces of Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, however, however in uh, western Virginia, Abraham Lincoln was shot and killed at Ford's Theater, as every American, I'm sure, knows, by the pro-Confederate white supremacist John Wilkes Booth. With the death of Lincoln died the hopes for an equitable or progressive reconstruction for many. Lincoln had just begun his second term, and to shore up support for his re-election in 1864 to abolish slavery through the 13th Amendment and to destroy the Confederacy, Lincoln had chosen Democrat from Tennessee, Andrew Johnson, as his running mate the year prior as a gesture of political unity. Uh, Johnson was one of the um, few people from the South, he was a, from, from Tennessee, big Tennessee politician, who decided to not endorse um, secession back in 1861 and, uh, and remained with the Union. And so his uh, cho being chosen as Lincoln's VP running mate, which didn't really mean as much then as it does now uh, as a position, was seen as a gesture to try and shore up a national unity government um, in 1864. Johnson was a conservative Democrat from Tennessee. Before the Civil War, he'd been the state governor and later senator and was assigned the post of occupied military governor over Tennessee during the Civil War. While he was one of the few politicians to oppose Confederate secession in the South and remained on the side of the Union, uh, Johnson was no abolitionist nor progressive. He was never fully on side with the emancipation of the slaves and had no interest in enforcing civil rights for newly liberated slaves, or freedmen as they were called. He was against citizenship rights or voting rights for black men, decrying it as the, quote, Africanization of the country. However, the Congress that sat under Lincoln was full of radical Republicans who sought the establishment and protection of equal rights for former slaves. Johnson's entire term was marked by fighting with Congress far to his left and would eventually culminate in his impeach impeachment, him being one of only two presidents to have be impeached um, by the House of Representatives, the other being Bill Clinton. With the death of Lincoln, Johnson immediately became the chief arbiter of Reconstruction. His policies allowed former Confederates to become instantly rehabilitated and take over government in the occupied states of the South again within a year, within several months, really, of the end of the war. And this brings us to social consciousness in the South. What was the South like at the end of the war? It was a, defeat, it was a defeated, failed nation. Uh, for white Southerners, the uh, feeling in the air after the Union victory, the total decimation of the South was fear and uncertainty. Shock still existed over the totality of the Confederate loss in 1865. Whereas their politicians, like Jefferson Davis or Alexander Stevens, told the white Southerners that their cause was invincible and undefeatable for the previous four years, the experiences of Sherman's conquest through Georgia or Lee's defeat in Virginia by Grant's army had decimated the morale of the South. They had been told that Cotton was king, the English or French intervention was on the way at any time, and the boys of Dixie were going to whip those Lincoln abolitionists in a few months. None of it happened. Their entire social myth that was the foundation of their separatist state was destroyed around them. The white supremacist foundation of the Confederate state was not helped with the advent of thousands of former slaves who had joined the Union Army returning to occupy the southern states as soldiers. As Confederate politician Howell Cobb said, quote, Use all the Negroes you can get. For all the purposes for which you need them but don't arm them, the day you make soldiers of them is the beginning of the end of the revolution. If slaves make good soldiers, our whole theory of slavery is wrong. During the war, the South went through occupation, wanton destruction, hyperinflation, starvation. The entire region had been thoroughly emasculated and humiliated by the war. The atmosphere bred hatred and bitterness like never before against liberated black slaves. One freed slave would testify that race relations were worse in his part of Virginia after the war than they were before it. Widespread resentment against occupying Union troops persisted by the whites, and many whites had become convinced that a Yankee-supported slave uprising in the style of the Haitian Revolution was going to play out on New Year's Day, 1866, and kill all the whites. It never came. These people were brought up in a society that affirmed to them their entire lives that black people were human property and nothing more. One in every three white families in the South owned slaves before the war. Black people, as less, less than white, wasn't just a social principle, it was an economic and political one as well. It was the one idea that tied the Southern mindset together as a nation and made it work in any way as a nation. Now it was being taken away by progressives and Republicans in the North. The rapidly changing path of American civil society that produced black citizenship and black voting rights was absolutely outside the realm of possibility or changed to most Southern whites. And this made white pro-Confederate resolve to Reconstruction stubborn and unwavering for years. 
It would produce lynchings, race riots, rapes, shootings, mutilations, and renewed subjugation for decades following the war. A century following the war, really. So, what was the black mindset like? The freed slaves of the South, the freedmen, were also shocked. These four million men, women, and children who were born into chattel slavery uh, and had toiled in a meager, painful existence their entire lives were suddenly released by Union troops. They no longer had to toil or work for anyone. Their slave masters often simply had to say, you're free now un under Union occupation and let them go, turn them loose. In many cases, uh, these f slaves were freed by black soldiers who were themselves escaped slaves in uniform. You've got to imagine that power display. It might be hard, hard to, uh, considering the kind of world we're brought up in, it's much more liberal than the one that any s slave lived in uh, before the Civil War, but these people were told their entire lives that they're human property, and then that their race was by default inferior to the white, to, to white races, and you might see black men in uniforms in power display killing white slave masters, white Confederate soldiers, and freeing you. That happened a lot. Uh, many, such as Virginia freedman Bailey Wyatt, uh, showed their devotion to freedom and economic liberation after the war because at this point, this uh, black consciousness in the South, it went from nil to many people to exploding in, in thought and theory. It became cosmopolitan very quickly, within months after the war, because this was really was, and this has been called this by many people in Civil War and Reconstruction historiography, the Civil War was the second American Revolution. It was a state-supported revolution in many ways, in that uh, slaves, about 200,000 of them, were given, given arms and sent to kill slave owners, slave masters, and to destroy a slave state. That stark, that, can you imagine that stark difference in that time? Just really want to drive that point home of how different it became so quickly. That, that Virginia Freedman, Bailey Wyatt, I was just talking about, um, he said in 1866 at a public unionist meeting, quote, We now as a people des desire to be elevated, and we desire to do all we can to be educated, and we hope our friends will aid us all they can. I may state to all our friends and to all our enemies that we have a right to the, to the land where we are located. For why? I tell you. Our wives, our children, our husbands have been sold over and over again to purchase the lands we now locate upon. For that reason, we have a divine right to the land. And then, didn't we clear the land and raise the crops of corn, of cotton, of tobacco, of rice, of sugar, of everything? And then didn't those large cities in the north grow up on the cotton and sugars and the rice that we made? Yes. I appeal to the south and the north if I hasn't spoken the words of truth. I say they have grown rich and my people is poor. So that historian from Yale, David Blaine, his analysis of this statement is an interesting one, and I thought I had to share it. It says that basically this is a former slave's uh, innate understanding, it's innate human understanding of the labor theory of value, in that the slave knows innately, he uses the word divine right, you could replace it with, uh, with uh, the right of labor or anything like that, and basically the principle stays the same as one that many socialists would espouse uh, still today, that because black laborers have toiled of the land, that the land belongs to them as they have improved upon it and created wealth through the transformation of the world, and that was the entire basis of their enslavement, was to create wealth for another race. Back in New Orleans, where we last saw black printers celebrating the departure of Copperhead and rebel slaveholders and their revolution of freedom, things were beginning to heat up. In the first, things were quite literally heating up that summer of 1866. The Louisiana Democrat, run out of Alexandria, Louisiana, reported in its August 1st issue that it had been 92 degrees Fahrenheit and counting almost every day the previous week, and that this oppressive heat wave was due to continue. Things were heating up, of course, in a less literal sense that summer as well, during this time of intense literal heat. Constitutional changes to the Louisiana state constitution had been proposed in 1864 that were set to be discussed more and possibly voted upon and ratified that summer by the Republican Constituent Assembly delegates. The delegates were set to meet New Orleans that summer on July 30th, 1866. The Republican delegates wanted to fight against the Democrats for an end to segregation and a restoration of black voting rights in the state, both of which were hopefully to be enforced by the military government then in place there. Specifically, this would mean ending the black codes, the precursor legislation to the Jim Crow that we know today. Democrats and other angry whites in the city would have none of this. On July 27th, three days before the convention was set to meet, black supporters of the Republicans met on the steps of the Mechanics Institute, which is the building where the convention was supposed to take place. 
The hundreds that gathered there listened to rousing speeches from former abolitionists and other supporters of ending the black codes and black leaders. They there determined that the day of the convention, July 30th, would be accompanied by a march put on by black supporters of the Republican delegates, some of which were themselves black, as a show of solidarity. Many of these black Republicans and progressives had previously been enlisted soldiers even in the Union Army. The white Southerners who would oppose them in the coming days in the streets, however, had many who had participated in the Confederate Army. On July 30th, the delegates met at the Constitutional Convention at the Mechanics Institute in New Orleans. The hot morning saw the conventional delegates meet, but then their meeting was postponed until 1.30 p.m. that afternoon, as there was no quorum present with which to conduct the proceedings, so they sent the sergeant-at-arms with a few assistants out into the city to try and gather the rest of the delegates. As the members of the delegation left the hall, they were greeted by the black demonstrators, this is early in the afternoon, who had just been joined by another crowd from further up the road. Now, it remains unclear who exactly commenced the violence. The reporter for the Louisiana Times, who was outside on the streets, witnessed what he thought was the catalyst event for it, however. This was when a policeman dragged off a black demonstrator, accompanied by shouts of stop him and kill the damned rebel from the black demonstrators in the crowd. Eventually, according to this Louisiana Times reporter, black demonstrators drew their weapons and fired on the officer when he refused to let the black demonstrator go. Another account in this same article by the Times has it that black demonstrators tripped up a white supporter on accident, enraging him and causing the initial commotion. Now, in reality, we don't know how true these accounts are, as it is probably much more likely that the white supremacist demonstrators gathered there, the, the crowd of white policemen, firemen, and white former Confederate supporters, it's probably much more likely that this group of white supremacist demonstrators were the ones to begin the violence with the verbal and physical provocations and attacks on black demonstrators that they were almost definitely throwing out that day. Another Louisiana Times correspondent was in the assembly hall of the Mechanics Institute during this period that day on July 30th, and he saw the violence from the windows of the Mechanics Institute. The reporter said that at one point, once some initial shooting and stone throwing had been started, someone who appeared to be a leader of the black demonstrators shouted that the police were, quote, rebel sons of bitches, and that, quote, any black who permitted himself to be arrested by them was a coward, end quote. Then, according to this Times reporter, a 12-year-old boy who had been swearing at the black demonstrators was knocked down by them. This being witnessed by a policeman present, he then drew his weapon and shooting from both sides commenced rapidly and escalated the situation from there. The Times reported then that at one point an old black washerwoman was in her yard in front of the violence in the, in the streets, and she encouraged the black people gathered there in her yard, the black men, to go and attack the police. When they refused, she locked the gate to her fence, locking the people gathered there inside. Feeling then safer behind this old washerwoman's fence, the men then grabbed the bricks from the pile in her yard and began to hurl them at the police. Then, according to the reporter who was inside of the Mechanics Institute, the rioters turned on the Mechanics Institute Hall, throwing bricks and sending bullets through the windows. At this point, many of the convention delegates, white and black, and themselves armed, drew their weapons and began debating what to do. The doors were fastened uh, and locked, but this locked many inside with nothing for cover from the hail of projectiles that were starting to flow in from the streets. Once the violence had escalated, black demonstrators and their white allies would attempt to flee inside of the building to hide, but they would find the doors locked because of this. Many were then only to able to take shelter inside the immediate entrance to the institute or, or the foyer. Cornered, many were beaten to death and massacred by the crowd of angry white supremacists. Only a few managed to escape, and those that attempted to flee the building were immediately seized by the violent crowd of white people. The reporter from the streets claims that at about this time, two in the afternoon, the police gathered and attempted to ask whether those inside the building would surrender, to which there was no response. Of course, in all likelihood, surrender for the black demonstrators gathered there would have meant certain death by hanging at a later date after a phony trial, or immediate beating to death by the mob then and there. So we can understand why even if there was such a call, which is doubtful, that no one would dare to take it up. The seizing of black people by the mob was enough to even surprise the correspondent of the Times there, who wrote that to see them, quote, mutilated and literally beaten to death as they sought to escape was one of the most horrid pictures it has ever been our ill fortune to witness, end quote. The violence continued in this way for some time until eventually the police had rounded up everyone that was left and sent them off to the station. 
Martial law was then declared until August 3rd, and police roamed the streets on mounts, in intimidating any black people who would dare to venture outside in the streets of New Orleans. Now notice with these accounts from the Louisiana Times how the black demonstrators call the policeman a rebel. This is because many of the white demonstrators, as I said earlier, and the policemen gathered there, had in all likelihood fought in the Confederate Army, and it was principally the police that would be used by the white supremacists to crush black movements in the South in towns and urban centers. The lead police chief of New Orleans at this time, one Harry T. Hayes, would even admit later to recruiting policemen specifically from the ranks of former Confederate soldiers in the city of New Orleans, cultivating a white supremacist force of violence. The way that the firemen, policemen, and white demonstrators appeared perfectly on the grid layout of the city streets, too, so that they could surround the black demonstrators gathered in front of the Mechanics Institute, leaves little room to doubt that at least some of the violence that happened that day was premeditated by the white supremacists gathered there. Thought about in broad terms, what essentially happened on July 30th, 1866, in the massacre in the city of New Orleans, is that a group of white supremacists trapped black demonstrators and their white Republican allies inside of the convention center to prevent a caucus and discussion on amending the state constitution to grant black voting rights and more equal citizenship from happening. This was political violence with a very real aim of asserting and protecting white dominance in the South politically and economically. In the rioting, more than 50 people, most of them black, were murdered, and scores more were injured, with sexual assaults against black women also likely to have happened. Though some white insurgents were jailed, none of them would do any serious time or be convicted for any crimes for their actions that happened on July 30th. Unfortunately, this kind of violence that we see in New Orleans on July 30th, 1866, was no strange thing to be happening in Reconstruction-era South. The New Orleans riot of 1866 came after earlier riots of a similar nature in Memphis, Tennessee in May of that same year. The Memphis riots saw some 45 people killed, again mostly black, as well as black homes, businesses, and schoolhouses burned to the ground or otherwise looted by a mob of white supremacists. The riots were also accompanied by at least five accounts of rape of black women by white looters, though there were likely more that went unreported. When people weren't rioting, demonstrating white wants to restore supremacy in most direct, obvious ways, racial violence could play out in other smaller ways, in more individualized ways. One instance of this was the murder in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, on July 22, 1866, of one J. Daly Burke, who was the son of a local judge. The Louisiana Times reported on this, quote, terrible murder in Baton Rouge, and quote, that Burke had been sitting on his porch, quote, to enjoy the evening breeze, end quote, after having supper with his sister and cousin when suddenly he was shot in the heart. Quote, from all the evidence which can be gleaned at present, the Times article continued, quote, the shooting is presumed to have been done by a Negro named Jack, formerly a slave belonging to Mr. Pierce, end quote. According to the Times, the dispute between Jack and Burke had arisen over the claims for a rabbit, which Burke had shot while hunting on, quote, this Negro's cotton patch, end quote. The rabbit was claimed by Jack, and, quote, he and Mr. Burke had some dispute about the possession of the animal, end quote. The Times then reported that Jack made some threat to the effect of cursing Burke and saying, God damn you, I will pay you for this, meaning that he would make Mr. Burke pay for his crimes. At the time of the reporting, the author noted that one black man had been arrested by the military and was going to be put through examination before he was being put on trial. Now, what's interesting about the way that this article frames the violence in the South, in, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in, in 1866, is in its language and the author's presumptions about the situation that are informed by his racism. Burke is presented as a man who had just had supper with his family, partaking in good Southern values of devotion to his family, before being abruptly shot while out enjoying the breeze, enjoying the nature of his farm. This follows two southern ideals of, of agrarianism, or the idea that the farming man is the one who is in tune with nature, the one who is the closest and the happiest southern man that a southern man can be. To close the article, the author even includes the fact that Burke, the white victim, was a member of the Confederate Army and had only just returned home from service a few days prior to being shot. Burke was, quote, much esteemed among his circle of friends, end quote. Not only then is Burke here painted in the agrarian ideal of Southern living, attending to his family and friends as well, but he was a veteran fighting for the old slave-owning South. To the white supremacist Southerner reading this, Burke would then be an upstanding citizen in their eyes. Jack, the black man accused by the author of having something to do with the murder, meanwhile, is not even given a last name. 
The only time that Jack, the supposed perpetrator of the crime, appears in the author's story is when he is made to look aggressive or when he is fighting over the possession of the rabbit or threatening Burke for it. Furthermore, Jack is frequently just objectified in blatantly racist terms. The rabbit wasn't killed on Jack's land, but rather, quote, this Negro's cotton patch, end quote. Jack here is denied humanity and agency wherever possible, except in cases where giving him agency can make him look more guilty and aggressive, playing into black stereotypes of, of black people as violent and difficult to deal with. The fact that Burke was clearly hunting on Jack's property without permission, and that Jack therefore had some cause to be upset was totally ignored by the author. Last, the author's inclusion of Jack's history as a former slave plays into the white Southern supremacist view that slavery had been a form of paternalistic protection for black people. The subtext of the article is that Jack, a newly freed man with his own farm, had now to resort to violence to protect it, and this is something that he would not have had to do had he still been under the supposed protection of a white slave owner. The slave-owning society, of course, was what Burke, the perceived victim here, had so, glorious fought, so gloriously fought for to maintain in his time in the Confederate Army. So violence like this was pervasive in the South, and there's a lot to unpack in the ways that it was reported by different newspapers, court proceedings, government publications, reports, and journals, memoirs, and private photographs as well. And the historian should not just take these sources at face value, but you really need to break them down at all of their component ideas of the time, these ideas that help produce the way that these sources were made in the very first place. Violence would continue in the South. No historian has compiled the number of black and white Republicans and progressives who were murdered in that wave of political violence in the South. But Mark Summers, a historian of Reconstruction, estimates that for the state of Louisiana in 1868 during the election season, Possibly as many or more as 2,500 white and black radical politicians were murdered. Given this climate, it is interesting that the first black governor of the state, W.S. Pinchback, would be had in 1871, only a few years after this incredibly violent wave and during this violent wave, I should point out. And this is after Pinchback was promoted to the post when, as acting lieutenant governor, the then governor was impeached. Pinchback would remain the only black governor of any state in U.S. history until the year 1990. Another source of incredible violence in the South during the Reconstruction era was born during this time in the form of the Ku Klux Klan. Though they first made their public appearances in 1866 and 1867 in and around Pulaski, Tennessee, the exact origins of the Klan are, are unknown. It's unclear when people in the Klan first started to use the name Ku Klux Klan. The group that are thought to have started it, the Midnight Rangers, was a local group, group out of Pulaski that were actually musicians. And the word ranger at this time meant to be one who was up to mischief or illegal activities late into the night. Though today we might think of organized marches and secretly connected societies of hooded white people, the Klan was initially in the 1860s and 1870s very unorganized and decentralized as an organization. Playing on local traditions and cultures such as music and serenading in the forms of performance inspired by actually Italian culture, the original clan in Tennessee, in Pulaski, was able to spread so rapidly in part because it was so transient and conforming to different cultural movements. The clan was so decentralized, in fact, that the members of it who felt themselves to be at the core of the original founders often complained about this fact. As a historian of the clan, Elaine France Parsons wrote in her article on them in the Journal of American History from 2005, quote, the clan was not an organization struggling to police its boundaries, but a, hetero a heterogeneous mass movement that included organized elements, end quote. The only thing that actually tied Klansmen together, argues Parsons, besides being overwhelmingly white, Southern, and Democratic, was their performative image. It was this image that also enabled so much of their violence, Parsons argues, because it set the stage for Klansmen to have some distance from their viewer, their audience. Everything with the Klan would feel scripted or rehearsed, and it was this spectacle and threat of violence that could often be just as powerful as the violence itself. For instance, when Klan chapters were first organized, it was typical for them to have political parades throughout the town that they were organized in or nearby, often with full display of clubs or other weapons, as well as ridiculous or theatrical elements like stuffed elephants or other paraphernalia on display. This theatricality made it seem like the Klan, unlike a group of politicians or normal humans, had no limits. There was nothing they could or would not do. As Parsons points out as well, there was no uniformity in the early days of Klan outfits. We, they didn't all wear the white hoods that we think of today. Some wore whatever cheap cloth they could find, others raccoon skin caps, others dressed in fancy lavish gowns reminiscent and even participatory 
participatory in Mardi Gras parades in the South, and others had on colorful makeup. Some dressed as Native Americans and put on funnier foreign accents and even dressed up as animals to make funny sounds in their costumes with as well. They would frequently claim to be ghosts of the Confederate dead and would come to visit recently freed black people in the South to assert the ghost of white supremacy. They would also visit, I should point out, uh, white supporters of black freed people as well. If theatricality and performative violence was important to Klan's success, so was actual violence. The congressional committee that was formed in the 1870s to investigate the violence against free black people in the South offers a good source for those interested in the history of Klan violence. The account of one Abram Colby, a black Georgian legislator, is demonstrative of the type of violence that the Klan would perform. You can read this account actually for free on facinghistory.org. On October 29, 1869, the Klansmen visited Colby. They broke open his door and then went into his house to drag him out of bed. In doing so, they threatened his wife and daughter at gunpoint, which Colby claims traumatized and scared his little girl basically to death. He was taken to the woods, where he was whipped brutally for three hours. That the violence was political was made plain to Colby in this instance. Quote, they said to me, do you think you will ever vote another damned radical ticket? I said, if there is an election tomorrow, I would vote the radical ticket, end quote. They set in and whipped me a few thousand licks more, with sticks and straps that had buckles on the ends of them, end quote. Colby was forced to leave the country, the county, excuse me, during the next elections. That Saturday night before the election, quote, I went to church. When I got home, they just peppered the house with shot and bullets, end quote. Asked by the committee how long it had taken Colby to recover, he responded that he still, three years later, had not gotten over it. Quote, they broke something inside of me, he said. I cannot do any work now, though I always made my living before in the barbershop, hauling wood, etc. End quote. The violence then wasn't only physical, but uh, with murders and physical and sexual assaults, rapes, property damage, and more, but also very mental and psychological, as Colby's experience shows. And with the theatrical nature of the Klan, too, you can understand especially how this would be psychologically damaging to have people in, in wild outfits show up in the middle of the night and threaten you and say, you can never participate politically again. Get out of here. The political nature of the Sioux cannot be emphasized enough. It was the type of violence that was driving black radicals out of politics all over the South and forcing them to flee to the North or stay out of politics for good. This political violence would pave the way, as we shall discuss now more, for the breakdown of Reconstruction legislation. With all this violence in the South after the war, particularly attention paid to major metropolitan areas like New Orleans and Memphis, uh, their riots, Congress of the United States, which uh, is under Republican control, uh, many abolitionists in Congress um, were elected during the war and stayed in after, they felt compelled to act. In response to the violence, a wave of progressive Republicans, or radical Republicans as they were called, were swept into Congress in the 1866 midterm elections, including many of the first black representatives and senators in states and national, le states and national levels that southern states had ever elected were elected uh, after this time. They passed in early 1867 the Reconstruction Acts, which were four separate bills meant to provide the more efficient government uh, for the rebel states. These acts created five military districts for the continued rule of the South until southern states had met the required conditions for re-entry into the Union. What were these requirements? Southern states had to ratify the new amendments that were being proposed or had already been added to the U.S. Constitution, the 13th, 14th, and the forthcoming 15th Amendments. Andrew Johnson, pres president of the Louisiana Black Republican, had lauded as their hero for the revolu revolution of freedom back in May of 1865 when he became president. Uh, right after he became president, was furious at the progressives and their legislation. In that same summer and fall of 1866, same year as the Memphis and New Orleans race riots, and with the midterm election coming up, Johnson went on a speaking tour that entirely tarnished what reputation he had in the North and showed himself fully as no friend of the freedmen. Whereas Johnson had already allowed the establishment of the neo-Confederate governments in the South right after the war, he did a tour called the Swing Around the Circle, in which he visited cities across the North to attack black civil liberty and republicanism, particularly the Republicans in Congress that were opposed to him. Johnson had hoped to get moderates to support his leniency on the Confederates. Instead, he pissed off virtually every major population center in the North. From Franklin's Reconstruction History, this is from John Hope Franklin. He was a historian at Duke University, whose book I read um, for this show. 
Um, quote, in Chicago, banners waving pro proclaiming to no welcome to traitors, and in Indian Indianapolis and Pittsburgh, the president was literally driven from the platform. Johnson attacked the Civil Rights Act, the 14th Amendment promising black citizenship, the idea of black voting, which was enshrined in the 15th Amendment, and his congressional opposition from the Republicans. As the North was solidly a Republican stronghold at this time, he did himself no favors. Additionally, a population that sacrificed hundreds of thousands of young lives to destroy the Confederacy had no interest in a Southern Democrat coming to them from, <laughs> from uh, his original home in Tennessee uh, to talk about a lenient approach to the Confederate leadership like nothing had happened. In Cleveland, one heckler shouted at the president, Hang Jeff Davis, the former pres president of the Confederacy. Johnson shouted back, why don't you hang Thad Stevens and Wendell Phillips, two prominent abolitionist politicians. After he walked off stage, one reporter told Johnson to mind his own dignity. The president replied, I don't care about my dignity. The exchange was carried in the Republican press nationwide and destroyed the president's image for many. At times, crowds drowned out the president as he spoke with, quote, three cheers for Congress. The speaking tour did Johnson no favors. Uh, the radicals would rejoice as the Republicans added nearly 40 new House seats that fall, giving them a veto-proof two-thirds majority. They actually had about, I think, 78 percent of the seats uh, in the House after that election. It would be over 60 years when such a lopsided result would be again duplicated by the New Deal Democrats under FDR during the Depression. The rest of Johnson's pitiful term would involve him trying to legislate action and Congress vetoing him and doing something else almost every time. So if this is the type of response and wants from Reconstruction that you're seeing now in 1866, it's different from that advocated by T.H. Robinson in his, his pamphlet, his sermon that I talked about at the beginning of the show. At this point, people are becoming more and more outraged by the violence that they're seeing in the South repeatedly, such as the riots in Memphis and New Orleans, and the repeated acts that they're reading about now in the newspapers of some new group called the Ku Klux Klan out of Tennessee and other parts of the South in 1866. And they want a more hard response. Of course, there were some in the North, too, to clarify who always wanted such a hardline response. There are different groups of people who feel differently about the way that Reconstruction in the South should be handled. In 1866, red radical Republicans will win, and it will be their vision of Reconstruction that will be played out. Absolutely. Um, I enjoyed Franklin's narrative on, um, on Reconstruction. Uh, I thought it had a lot to give because he is a black historian from who grew up in the South. He was born, I think, in 1915, which means he was in his 40s when Jim Crow ended. So, and his grandfather apparently was a slave and a freedman uh, after after the Civil War. And so, I think he had a very interesting narrative. So, um, everyone talks about Eric Conner's short history of Reconstruction, but also I would say I would put on that last John Hope Franklin's Reconstruction after the Civil War as a little aside there. But uh, he makes an argument that northern whites actually were harder on the, wanted a harder approach on the Confederacy than was actually done and were shifting more towards the radical Republican side of things because they actually had come over the past four years of war to actively hate the Confederate government and its military, of course. So many people had lost husbands and sons to uh, fighting the slave power in, between the, in those four years. So... Um, this uh, move towards the Reconstruction Acts happened after the Republicans won uh, their landslide victory in 1866. This is perfectly emulated by the first big, this is the first big project they ever tried to do, and it perfectly emulated their resolve in uh, trying to actively change Johnson's path of Reconstruction. The idea was to correct the leniency of Johnson and to really double down on the Southern occupation, the full implementation of the 14th Amendment to give black people citizenship, and the 15th Amendment to give voting rights to black men. Within the first three weeks of the new Congress taking their seats, the Republicans pushed through two new Reconstruction Acts, dividing the South into five military occupation zones directly overseen by an appointed general. And also, it should be noted that uh, the, the, um, the officer corps of the Army was still very Republican at this time. When In 1864, they voted 80% for Lincoln um, over uh, his opponent, uh, George McClellan. So basically, it meant a Republican was going to oversee from the Army um, Reconstruction in these military regime zones. Uh, these, re these military regimes had the power to remove and appoint government officials at will in the occupied South. Additionally, the skeleton of the 15th Amendment was drawn up in the Reconstruction Acts. States were required to create voter registration rules for both black and white men and to establish new constitutions made in biracial conventions that protected black voting rights. This would lead to the creation of Republican governments across the South and allow 
if only for a brief time, a renaissance of biracial political expression in the South and a renaissance of black political thought. This is exactly the type of thing that you would see in Louisiana, and you can see how the New Orleans, uh, you can see how the New Orleans riots would affect directly the types of information that would be in this legislation too, because in this legislation is protection for exactly the type of convention that was had in New Orleans and that was rioted upon in 1866. Yes, indeed. So basically, once uh, once the Republicans got this, you know overwhelming majority in Congress. Johnson was a virtual placeholder in his final two years of office. He couldn't really do it much. He had been impeached by the Republican House and had only narrowly escaped uh, removal from office by one vote in the Senate, I believe. In the 1868 presidential elections, he tried to win renomination from his party, but his party did not want to touch him with a 10-foot pole. They instead nominated former New York Governor Horatio Seymour. The Republicans nominated General Ulysses S. Grant, and Grant won by 300,000 votes. As approximately half a million freed black slaves voted for Grant, this was the first ever election in American history decided by a racial minority's vote. Grant was well-intentioned and very much a progressive for his time. He appointed Native Americans to government posts, such as making his former wartime aide-de-camp, uh, Seneca Indian Eli Parker, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. It's the first time uh, Native Americans ever been in charge of uh, their own body in, in the executive uh, branch. He put many minority, demogra minority demographics into positions of state power, such as blacks, Jews, Catholics, uh, various immigrants. Grant was one of the f first major presidents to build an administration that could be considered by our modern standards as multicultural or representative. He also regularly used his power as commander-in-chief to protect black voters during his time in office from Klan attacks and designated the Klan as a terrorist organization. However, it was marred by economic panic, big one in 1873, and perceived Republican political corruption and patronage from the business community. And this cost the Republicans prestige and confidence to the, with the general public. In the 1870 midterm votes, they lost their two-thirds majority. Though Grant won re-election in 1872, he was unable to shore up Republican support for the ongoing Reconstruction efforts, and the Republicans lost Congress to the Democrats finally in 1874. It should be said, too, briefly, that if Grant's administration and his appointments of, of people of, of different races and ethnicities for the first time, one of the first times in American history, was surely considered progressive for the time, that these administrations by were by no mean, means, however, progressive in the modern sense of the word, that they still held very paternalist, especially in the case of the Indian Affairs uh, Commission. Uh, they held very paternalist views on what to be done about their different ethnicities and races. So uh, just keep that in mind yeah. that we should take this with a grain of salt that is not quite progressive in the way we would think of, but indeed it was progressive for the time to have any people of minority racial or ethnic mm. status in the United States in any type of government post. Indeed. Um, moving more towards black politics in the South during this time, once there was actually Republican administrations through the Reconstruction Acts that were ab able to make a black, black political culture with freemen, um, we should start with talking about the Freedmen's Bureau. One of Abraham Lincoln's last pieces of legislation was passed a month before his dead, death in March 1865. It established the creation of the Freedmen's Bureau, an agency within uh, Stanton's War Department. Its purpose was to procure basic goods and food to liberated slaves, to aid them, and to protect them from white racial violence in the South. Though the Bureau was greatly weakened and defanged by Johnson, who claimed it fostered a dependency environment of freedmen onto the government. Yes, it's a racist myth. We still hear about things like welfare queens and things like that. Um, it still persisted. It still persists today. It's 150 years old at the very least. Yeah. Um, despite that, ter uh, despite the um, that uh, terroristic violence from the Ku Klux Klan and neo-Confederate mob violence, people of the Freedmen's Bureau uh, worked against that and for the noble task of trying to protect black civil liberties in the South. They worked with black community and church leaders, um, build and support black schools and businesses. It's a daring challenge with insurmountable odds. Many federal employees from the North were brutally murdered for trying to enforce the 14th and 15th Amendments. They were decried by uh, racist Southern whites as carpetbaggers that were trying to move down and destroy their peculiar institution and way of life. Dozens of recently created black schools by the program were burned down by the KKK. Teachers and administrators were lynched or otherwise murdered in various ways. In testimony to the Congressional Joint Committee overseeing Reconstruction, both black and white Southerners testified on the necessity of the Freedmen's Bureau and Army. One black man said to Congress, quote, A freedman was shot on one of the plantations in the Carlton District of South Carolina by an unknown assailant, and that a woman was tied up by the thumbs and kept so for more than an hour. 
With the new advent of black voting rights through the Reconstruction Acts, coupled with military and Freedmen's Bureau of protection against white violence, black men were elected to a myriad of government positions across the Deep South. Men who just three years prior had been regarded as human property became aldermen, mayors, legislatures, uh, state bureaucrats and legislators, etc. Some 2,000 black men held such positions across the South. Hiram Revels, a Methodist minister, was elected to be Mississippi's uh, senator in 1870. Before the war, the Mississippi Senate seat was held by Confederate President Jefferson Davis. Fifteen black or mixed-race men from seven southern states served in the House of Representatives during this time, and even slightly after Reconstruction formally ended, they still served in the House. About 700,000 black men qualified to vote with the new provisions of the Reconstruction Acts, instantaneously making them a huge block of, the southern, of southern political life. Possibly 90 to 95 percent of them could not read or write, but they still displayed hope and enthusiasm in navigating or learning the uh, liberal Republican political process. Um, it should be said that uh, the reason they couldn't read or write is because it was actually illegal in every southern state to teach a slave literacy. Um, and it was even illegal in some northern states to do it. And so that's why the vast majority of them, anyone who could read or write was very privileged or in the right spot at the right time where they could be illegally taught to do so. Or they would frequently learn also from going to church and hearing and putting together when they would hear the, the pastor read from the Bible, they could then hear the word with the, while reading along in the text of the Bible in their pews. And that was also a way for frequently for uh, poor black men and women to learn how to read and write when they otherwise might not have. Indeed. We talk about, um, there's a reason why Hiram Revels was a Methodist minister probably. Uh, Church ministries, like mainline Southern Protestant denominations like Methodists and Baptists, they were one of the few th few opportunities in which, apparently, especially like free uh, black people, uh, you know, free people that weren't enslaved, there was a very small amount of black people in the South before the war that were free technically, mm -hmm. but they still had a very hard life. Um, Hiram Revels was one of those, and uh, one of the few things they could do in uh, public life was become church leaders um, that and oversee black con black congregations, and that's also why, still to this day in the South, there are black churches that uh, are entirely black congregations. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and uh, one freed slave, Beverly Nash, expressed at the South Carolina State Constitutional Convention, where he was a delegate, that quote. I believe, my friends and fellow citizens, that we are not prepared for this suffrage, but we can learn. Give a man tools and let him commence to use them, and in time he will learn a trade. So it is with voting. Uh, John Hope Franklin writes that in addition to not being literate, many of these black people didn't have family names. Some didn't even know their own names. They'd just been called boy or racial epithets their entire lives. Now they found themselves, virtually overnight, in a position to dictate state policy. In Louisiana, exactly 50% of the convention, convention delegates were freedmen. In South Carolina, 61% were freedmen. Despite their previous experiences of slavery's inhumanity and the continuing attacks from organizations like the KKK or white mobs, blacks still sought equitable and amicable relations with white Southerners. Nash himself considered the white man a true friend, quote, and desired the races to lock arms together and unite. A black delegate to Alabama's convention, James Rapier, asked Congress to remove the political sanctions on former Confederate statesmen and that they may help aid Reconstruction. Even the Democratic newspaper, The Clarion, wrote in its columns that black members, quote, show consideration for the feelings of the whites. The colored people had manifested no disposition to rule or dominate the whites, and the only color line which had existed grew out of the unwise policy which had previously been pursued by the Democratic Party in its effort to present the enjoyment by the newly emancipated by the newly pansented race of the rights and privileges to which they were entitled. A democratic newspaper, uh, owned presumably by very racist white supremacist Southerners, wrote that. Black reformers were as conservative and gradual as they possibly could have been uh, with Reconstruction. Still, this was too much for white supremacists in the South. These few years of vibrant interracial political democracy would be done away with soon enough. Bigger proponents of disfranchisement of Confederates were the so-called Scalawags. These were white Southern Republican supporters who supported an end to the plantation system and race equality with, with their black counterparts. Black freedmen were defensive of former Confederates often in hopes of preserving the ideals of universal suffrage. So in many cases, uh, black freedmen that found themselves in positions of uh, political power or social power, uh, they were more lenient on Confederates than white radical Republicans in D.C. were, or even like white Republicans in the South, the Scalawags were. Uh, they had took uh, the most gradualist approach that ever could be possibly hoped for, considering the circumstances of what had happened, and it still was too radical for white supremacists in the South. On to army occupation. One, rep 
Once uh, Republican Reconstruction programs came to power, full of black men as both representatives and voters, the army began to be seen as not so necessary in the occupation of the South to protect them. Uh, the thought, the thought beginning to take place in the North was, well, all these black men got elected to positions. There are black men in Congress now. Maybe we can start uh, scaling back the number of troops we're keeping in the South and uh, bring some of them back and let, leave them to their own devices. Troop numbers were consistently declining. By the end of 1869, just a thousand federal troops remained in the entire state of Virginia, um, one of the largest Confederate states. In Texas, just over 4,600, with nearly 80% of those away from population centers fighting Indians on the frontier instead. With this decline in troop numbers, there was no line of state defense against the activities of race mobs or the KKK. With the passage of the new amendments, the 13, 14, and 15, the southern states were allowed to re-enter the Union at the end of the decade, with military authority dissolving. Just after the authorities left Georgia, conservative Democrats attacked three black senators and 29 representatives to the state legislature. They were individually forced out of office. One, Aaron Bradley, was expelled from his seat after the white majority legislature cited him for gross insults. After August 1868, just four black men remained in office, as their light skin made it difficult to prove them black through their ancestry. Finally, in September, the Georgia Assembly voted to declare all black men ineligible to sit in session at the state legislature. 136 black men converged in Macon to protest. When it was brought to the state Supreme Court, the decision of the White Assembly was overridden and blacks were declared eligible again. The next spring, the legislature voted down the 15th Amendment and Georgia was put under military rule a second time by Washington and Grant. Finally, the legislature was forced to ratify it and to give its expelled black members back pay. Amazingly, a black member, newly returned to his seat, introduced his first bill to give compensation to white representatives who were also displaced. So, again, the uh, amicability from black legislatures can't be, can't be understated at this time, considering the opposition they're finding themselves with. So this episode with Georgia's expulsion and reoccupation is just one of far too many of the era. Across every southern state... There came violence against black families everywhere, always. As a troop presence and northern zeal for Reconstruction was diminishing, this only increased. Attacks were also unleashed on black radical and Republican groups and militias, such as the Lincoln Brotherhood and the Union League. The Republican post-war strength was dying, and the Democratic Party in the North had successfully used its new departure strategy to separate itself from the pre-war slave power. The Panic of 1873 uh, further, furthered the draw of attention away from the reality of the post-war South. New white supremacist groups like the White League formed at this time and actively attacked state governments, as in Louisiana in 1874 and 75. In Mississippi in 1875, the so-called Mississippi Plan was put in action, using political violence, murder, bribery, and intimidation of freedmen to effectively curb the influence of their vote and, uh, consequently, the Republican strength to bring Southern Democrat conservatives back to power. And such strategy was duplicated across the South by other conservative whites. It worked everywhere. After came 1876, which was a very critical year. The Republican strength had been severely weakened by terrorist militias like the Red Shirts and the White League and the KKK, and they came out from the woodwork everywhere to reestablish white supremacy. During this decade, the Southern Democrats rebranded themselves like the, Northern, like the Nor Northern Democrats did. Basically, these two wings of what are technically the same party are very, very much splitting in opposite directions because they don't want to touch each other. They call themselves the Redeemers, as in they had redeemed the South, and they were now full members of the Union again. Mm -hmm. So as these black Republicans are forced from the South and, and black voters are suppressed through heinous acts of violence from the Klan, rioting, individualized acts, and other, other Democratic plots like the Mississippi Plan and more, white Democrats are able to take back these seats and take back their state legislatures to do with as they will. This is in the very late 1860s and early 1870s. And so these Democrats who come back in are said to have redeemed the South. And why do they redeem it? They redeem the South because they help to bring the South back to its old ideal of a white supremacist region of the United States. One of the final blows and final victories of the Redeemers when they finally codify and, and retake back their power in their eyes is with the Compromise of 1877, an informal agreement between the Republicans and Democrats in Congress. So the Compromise of 1877 uh, came after the presidential election of 1876, which uh, goes down as one of the most contested elections in American history. The Republican candidate, Rutherford Hayes, would win the electoral vote by just one, 185 to 184, against his Democratic opponent, Samuel Tilden. 
The suppression of the black vote by organizations like the White League and the Klan likely stopped more Republican turnout from freedmen in the South, which might have swung the, ele the election more firmly towards Hayes. Tilden won the popular vote by nearly 250,000 over Hayes. To get the Democratic House, which now had two dozen more Southern seats since the enfranchisement of black men to vote on his side, Hayes agreed to several things that would eventually be known as the Compromise of 1877. You see, when the, ha when the uh, House decided to allocate more seats to the South, the thought at the time was black men will be voting too, uh, so it'll be whites voting Democrat and blacks voting Republican. Thing is, when blacks are being forced at gunpoint not to vote, mm -hmm. that's just more uh, Southern white Democrat conservative seats in the House. Yeah, more of a Southern white majority when blacks just don't have any votes at all. So the points of the Compromise in 1877, all federal troops were to be withdrawn from the southern states where they still remained. In reality, in 1876, there were only remaining federal troops really in the states of Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida. Everywhere else, as Grant uh, enumerated earlier with his episode of discussing Georgia, for instance, states, when they had been ratifying the 14th and 15th Amendments and fulfilling these requirements under the Reconstruction Acts to come back in to the Union in the North, they had been, for the most part, losing their federal troops. They had The North had said, all right, you've fulfilled these requirements. We're going to pull federal troops out. When that wasn't happening, troops were also moving out because, as Grant pointed out, they were being pulled away, such as in Texas, from urban centers to the West, to the frontier, as it was called, to fight against American Indians and fight other, other battles for the advancing forces of unbridled capitalism in the Western United States. And when that wasn't happening, uh, the Democrats could always resor resort to bribes or murder or violence to intimidate or threaten Republicans who were in power to get them to remove uh, federal troops from the South. So they had a myriad of tactics and a myriad of different processes were affecting the presence of troops in the South. But the Compromise of 1877 ensures that no federal troops will remain. All of them are now pulled out. Other points of the deal were the codification of a new transcontinental railroad and other economic legislation to help industrialize the South. All these things were promised to Southern Democrat uh, congressmen. Rutherford Hayes was to have a Democratic Southerner in his cabinet, and he could remain as president uncontested by a Democratic filibuster, provided all of these things would go through. Now, with the last federal troops out of the South, free reign to entreat with black citizens however they wanted, or what was known as home rule, and those that resisted moved and forced to move out of the South through terrorism, the white supremacy of the South was reassured until it would face its next serious challenges, not until nearly a century later with the 1950s and 1960s civil rights movements emerging. The so-called Jim Crow legislation that basically really codified these states as apartheid states within the American Union uh, started coming in, in the 1880s, in the 1890s, and the early 1900s. Uh, state constitutions were rewritten from the more liberal Republican uh, constitutions that were forced to be written, that they were forced to write under um, bi biracial coalitions under federal occupation back in the 1860s. Mississippi was the first to do so in 1890. Um, they introduced new voting qualifications that overwhelmingly targeted black people and sometimes poor white people. Uh, so it would have been unconstitutional to go against the 15th Amendment because they were forced to ratify it to get readmitted back into the Union. And so they couldn't say black people can't vote mm -hmm. in uh, the constitutions of the states. But they could say you have to meet a certain income requirement or pay this and pay this poll tax to vote knowing that 90% of the people that wouldn't meet it are poor black people that you've not given land, you've not given the tools to build uh, an equitable lifestyle, of course they're not going to pay it. You've, you've damned them to what uh, Blight called a, life of, a lifetime of debt peonage uh, as toilers, as peasants, basically. Mm -hmm. um, this also affected poor white people who couldn't vote. And uh, are also literacy requirements. Um, this... Most black people still couldn't read because the schools were bad, and obviously these white supremacist legislators aren't going to start teaching black people um, how to read and write when they don't need to. It was illegal just before the war to do that in any way. And so this targeted the very poor and the, and, uh, the black populations of these states, that they were basically totally unable to change anything. Another one was the grandfather clause, where this is one of the most obvious of them, but... Uh, in some states, it was it was said that uh, you can vote uh, if you've had family, uh, if your family has owned like a parcel of land for more than three generations. Three generations back was before the Civil War. What slave owned property? Mm -hmm. <laughs> None. That's kind of the whole point of slavery. And so this rollback of rights, the Jim Crow legislation that 
t- basically made black people in the South not that much better than what they were, what they had before um, happened just 30 years later. They had the right to vote, and within 40 years in every southern state, it was taken away from them. And nationally, too, with the, the changing situation of an increasingly industrializing and urbanizing north and Democrats resorting to more tactics, uh, more nuanced tactics, such as in New York, where you get like a boss tweet of Tammany Hall uh, with Democrats and Republicans changing their tactics nationally, uh, you see Republicans that are increasingly less willing to, to challenge what they see going on in the South. So Republicans are clinging on to power as long as they can. And they're not willing, as you see in the Compromise of 1877, but also in other instances with continued economic recession every five or eight years. So what people don't realize about this period in American history, too. There is a recession like every five or eight or ten years. They call them a, panics. Yeah. A massive recession, yes. Exactly what you might say Karl Marx was talking about. He was seeing them the world over every five or ten years. Indeed. Um, and these things happen continuously. So Republicans are only barely holding on to power in some cases. So they're not about to go challenge whatever agreements they have with Southern Democrats that are enabling that stay in power. And so th- this means that they're not going to challenge it when they see Southern Democrats adopting in their states Jim Crow measures to disenfranchise blacks. They just don't because they're greedy and want to hold on to political power. And that's the end of it. And that's why the process of Reconstruction had to last 100 years instead of 5 yes. or 10 years. What Eric Foner called the uncompleted or unfinished revolution, and it's a process that's still yeah. going on today. Yeah, you have to ask yourself, uh, is Reconstruction still going on? I would say it is to a lesser extent mm-hmm. than it used to be. Um, and we have to ask ourselves about the legacy of it, too. There's so much historiography that is the writing of history about Reconstruction. There might be more about Reconstruction than there is about the Civil War itself, actually, um, in, in American historiography. And uh, it's changed so much in recent years. The idea of the lost cause uh, mythology that is so prevalent around the Civil War and Reconstruction about uh, this uh, state that was trying, this uh, southern state that uh, seceded and was trying to fight for its rights against. Uh, a dictatorial Republican government in Washington that totally uh, whitewashes over that it was a state made to sub- subject four million men, women, and children into human bondage for their entire lives because that's what its entire society was built around. That was prevalent for so long. You'll still see you're still in the South. There are textbooks you can find that try to downplay um, what the Civil War was about and what re- what happened during Reconstruction. Uh, still to this day, you'll hear, you're, you'll hear people say it. You'll hear people call Lincoln a tyrant and things like that. Um, it's disgusting, and uh, it still shapes the way we think about Reconstruction, especially today. Mm-hmm. And Reconstruction as a as a failed process, too. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the last bastions of, of Reconstruction success uh, was Wilmington in Wilmington, North Carolina. And Wilmington, North Carolina was different because for a myriad of reasons— uh, Black Republicans and uh, some even black Democrats or black non-aligned voters managed to stay in power, managed to build to some extent a comfortable bastion, you might say, of of black middle class life in the South. And to the point that uh, after a few decades of successful unopposed Reconstructionism politics in North Carolina, Democrats had had enough. uh, Racist white supremacist Democrats had had enough. And so – in 1898, November 10th, you see the last bastion of successful Reconstructionist politics in the South fall, or one of the last bastions, I should say. There were a few other uh, morsels or inconsistencies. But Wilmington is one of the last bastions to fall when on November 10th, 1898, the Democrats had conspired basically through a series of mob and white riots, race riots, to go through the town and remove physically legislators from office, black Mayor, black uh, black office holders in town and black representatives, they physically removed them or murdered them. And it was basically a coup d'etat that happened in the United States in Wilmington in 1898. And this destroys basically the last bastion of black middle class or black republicanism, reconstruction politics in the South and assures white supremacy in the South for the next 50 or 60 years to come. Yep. It's still um, a largely unstudied field in many ways that we still are just still trying to grasp the depth of. Like Nick said earlier, there still hasn't been um, a total 
a total collected data set to say how many people were killed by political violence during Reconstruction. 2,500 uh, voters or um, politicians or activists were killed in Louisiana in 1868, maybe. Um, that's just one year out of 12 or 13 or 15 years, depending on how you measure Reconstruction. It's just one state out of all that. Um, how many thousands of people more aren't being talked about that did die mm -hmm. so that white supremacy could reestablish itself in the former Confederacy? And there's that lost cause myth, too, that reigned for so long in American historiography that the reason that Reconstruction politicians uh, – and black radical Republican politicians left office or had to leave office in the South in the 1860s and 1870s was because they were corrupt. And we're only in the past 40 years has this narrative been challenged and have we really started to understand that, no, the reason that black radical politicians had to leave the South in the 1860s and 1870s is because they were murdered and terrorized out of the South. Mm -hmm. That is the reason that black politics in the South was stifled. It wasn't uh, because of corruption. It was because white supremacists put a gun to any black politician who would challenge them. They put a gun to their heads and forced them out or killed them so they couldn't challenge them anymore. Indeed. Well, we hope you, that you've enjoyed uh, today's show on People's History Hour. Um, we hope to be back with you soon. Uh, if you want to know our schedule, you can look up uh, a pin post on our, our Facebook page where it will show you exactly what we have for the rest of the summer for the next uh, month and a half or so. We hope you've enjoyed today, and uh, we hope to see you again soon. Thanks, folks. Só de você, sempre foi só de mim.